Hey friends, welcome back to the Journal Feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. We are here to keep you up on the literature, and to do that, we spoon-feed it to you. If you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber, and so will not be receiving the full Journal Feed podcast, only getting a portion of the past week's articles. Don't worry, they're all good articles, but... If you would like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you'll have to become a member. All the details for that are at journalfeed.org. And remember that we don't ever want money to be a barrier to better patient care, so if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, reach out, get in touch with us, we'll help you out. This is the audio version of the past week's articles, which this week were brought to you by Millie Koss, Gabby Leonard, Kitan Patel, Vivian Lay, and Clay Smith. So without further ado, I bring you the first article titled High Risk and Low Prevalence Diseases, Orbital Cellulitis, out of the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. Every patient presentation has at least one scary thing that it could be. For red puffy eyes, it's orbital cellulitis. Sometimes called post-septal cellulitis because it's an infection deep to the septum that causes these cases. The human body has so many cool places that it can hide infections, places you wouldn't even think about, but you have to think about post-septal cellulitis because it is a vision-threatening diagnosis. Most of the time, the infection will have spread from something else nearby that's already infected, and it spreads into the orbital cavity. Most commonly, this will be ethmoid sinusitis, but it can also be from trauma, dacrocystitis, dental infections, post-surgery, or anything that can get bacteria into that space. That said, any of those same things could also cause just, you know, run-of-the-mill pre-septal cellulitis, which still requires antibiotics, but doesn't risk vision loss. Red flags that you must be on the watch for are all things caused by the tissues that are found deeper in the eye being affected. So if you think about the structures which are behind the septum, then you can kind of figure out the symptoms. If the extraocular muscles are inflamed, then you would expect pain with eye movements and possibly even diplopia because of limitations in eye movements. Infections in a closed space, of course, can cause a pressure buildup, which could result in proptosis and even sometimes chemosis. More pressure will affect blood flow, unfortunately, which will cause harm to the optic nerve first before most other things. And this can cause RAPD and sometimes decreased visual acuity. Lastly, the eyes, of course, are the window into the soul, but also into the brain. So any CNS deficits could be from spread of the infection from the orbit into the cranium. The go-to test to assess for orbital cellulitis is a CT of the orbits and head with and without contrast. This will assess for infection and the extension of the infection into the brain. If the CT is negative but you're convinced, then you could keep searching and get an MRI. Labs are great for confirmation bias, but normal labs don't really mean terribly much. Not even a CRP can be relied on, but it's much more likely to be elevated in postseptal cellulitis than preceptal cellulitis. Now, like most severe infections, you'll want to admit these patients for IV antibiotics. First-line choices, for adults at least, would include something like vancomycin plus piperacillin tazobactam. Now, almost every complaint in the emergency department has a can't-miss diagnosis, and orbital cellulitis is really one of those diagnoses for the eye. In a spoonful, orbital cellulitis isn't common, but it can be devastating. Watch out for red flags like painful eye movements, photophobia, diplopia, decreased visual acuity, and proptosis. And then we have the second article titled, Success Rates of Lateral Canthotomy and Cantholysis for Treatment of Orbital Compartment Syndrome out of the American Journal of Emergency Medicine. Now, emergency medicine is, of course, obsessed with our HALO procedures. High acuity, low occurrence. HALO. Why are we obsessed? Because we are expected to know how to do these things, but they come up so rarely that very few of us get to do them with any kind of regularity, and so it's kind of scary. A lateral canthotomy and cantholysis fits into this category, which is of course a treatment for orbital compartment syndrome. Orbital compartment syndrome, like many compartment syndromes, is most common after trauma and occurs due to the accumulation of blood in a closed space. Of course, anything else raising the compartment pressure could also cause this. In this case, the closed space that we're talking about is the orbit. 
Now a high enough pressure will mean that blood can no longer flow into the orbit, and this will lead to ischemia of the optic nerves and blindness as a result. When you have a compartment in the limb, you do a fasciotomy. You open the compartment to relieve the pressure. Same for the eye, but here most of the walls of the orbit are bone, and the last wall is the eye. We can't directly cut any of those things, so to add a little bit of space, we can actually let the eye come further out. We do this, of course, by cutting the canthal ligaments. This is stressful because we don't do this very much, so how good are we at doing this? A successful procedure on the first attempt would be if the intraocular pressure decreases, which is all we really want. These authors said that the pressure needed to come down to at least 30 millimeters of mercury, which would still be high, but not like vision-threatening high. Now, they had 74 eyes with suspected ocular compartment syndrome, and 50 of them ended up getting canthotomy and cantholysis. What's amazing is that the first attempt success was not significantly different between emergency medicine providers and ophthalmologists. But when the EM doctors did fail in those cases, then the procedure was completed by the ophthalmologists, who probably aren't going to fail. Worse visual acuity was reported when there were delays due to multiple attempts. But even worse was not doing a procedure at all. Honestly, 70 to 80% success rate, even for emergency medicine providers, that's pretty good considering it's not something we really do very often. This is all actually really encouraging. Worse outcomes if you wait, and on the first attempt, we're pretty much as good as the people who do this kind of stuff all the time. I think that's great to hear, so you've just got to go for it if you think you need to. Always keep a high suspicion for ocular compartment syndrome. The only reason not to do it is if they have a globe rupture. So, you know, get some practice in during simulations if you can, and then be emboldened by the fact that's probably not that hard to do since people like us can do it about as well as the people who really know how to do it. In this wonderful, this retrospective study shows that emergency medicine doctors are about as good on the first try as ophthalmologists at doing a canthotomy and cantholysis to save a patient's vision. And that's it. That's all, guys. Let's wrap up. What did we learn today? From the first article, infected eyes are usually fairly benign, but orbital cellulitis certainly is not. Be on the watch for red flags, and when in doubt, get a CT. Second, don't be scared. You can cut the eye open to save the eye itself if you have to. Ophthalmology can clean up the rest of the mess later and make it look pretty, but for now, you should take that step and save that eye. Again, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not part of the members feed, and so you missed three articles from this past week. What were they about? Well, someone invented a band-aid that could help replace stitches. After that, ASAP put out a clinical policy statement answering a few important questions about the diagnosis of acute appendicitis. And then finally, how do you best manage the epiglottis during pediatric intubations? I could have told you if you had heard the article. Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org, where the newsletter is the best way to make the podcast into a bite-sized nugget of spaced repetition. Our goal here is for you to read less, learn more, and save lives, one spoonful at a time.